It is officially game week here in Iowa. The Iowa Hawkeyes getting back on the horse, as they say, with South Dakota State coming to town here on September 3rd. Your schedule breakdown, game-by-game predictions from myself, a couple buddies of mine that uh, have been doing this annual show for a number of years. Plus, we'll look at the roster position by position, break it all down for you during week 201. Brad has branded thoughts. This is from the Hawkeye of the Storm. You may have heard of the real-life Hawkeye man cave known as Kinnick Under the Kitchen. Well, after lots of hard work, there's not much space left to paint, but the walls are exploding out for public consumption. Under the Kitchen is proud to announce that you can now purchase exclusive prints of some of your favorite Hawkeye legends, including wrestling great Spencer Lee, football players Tyler Goodson, Riley Moss, and Drew Tate, Plus, an all-in-one Murray family legacy print featuring Keegan, Chris, and Kenyon Murray himself. Signed and unsigned prints are available, making the perfect collectible or gift for any Hawkeye enthusiast. For more information on purchasing one of these outstanding Hawkeye prints, visit Under the Kitchen on Facebook. That's Under the Kitchen on Facebook. Week 201 of Brada's Branded Thoughts. It's been a year since these guys were on the show with me. I want to warn everybody before we get into the show, ain't nobody claiming to be, well, I'd like to think that I'm some degree of an expert on my good days. Uh, You made it very clear. Both of you made it very clear. You're not claiming to be experts. You're here because we've been doing this show for like 10 years. I watch the games. That's it. (laughs) (laughs) If if you're you're a big fan of this show, I'm pre-warning you now. All right. I hope you get breakdown almost any other day when you watch this channel on YouTube. I can assure you, you're not going to get the full fixing this evening, but I'm going to try to do my best. But uh, I I figured maybe we should flash back to last year because we can all take joy and humor in this. Here is a uh, comment from a a listener, Ken Hansmeyer, and I'm going to have... uh, I'm going to have Noah read this to our audience. Noah, would you uh, do the honors? Okay. Um, The guy in the top right is a great voice and setup guy. The experts he throws softball to are striking out. So, listen, I'm not going to say who the guy in the top right was or the experts that were striking out, but we all found some humor in that I, mean, I, I think I, we all know who's who. He said it initially. I, I commented back to him. I said, I, I got to tell you, I laughed my tail off when I heard this. <laughs> I mean, it's just funny. I took a great joy in it. So we are going to talk depth chart. Now, we're not going. We're recording this on Saturday, August 27th. Expect the podcast to drop. Um likely either Sunday or Monday. Uh, so this, the, my understanding is that the official game week depth charts will be released by the University of Iowa Monday. So we're not going to be looking at the depth chart from a perspective of, okay, this guy's one, this guy's two. We're looking at depth, purely at depth. And we'll give some insight as far as uh, news and notes that have changed over the, or, or I should say positions that have changed guys that I, one guy who I don't believe is going to be uh, a part of fall football for Iowa uh, that's on the de- the preseason depth chart and whatnot. So we'll go through some of those changes, talk about the depth of these different positions, and um, we'll get into the schedule. We'll break down each game individually. Uh, this is an hour-long show. We have done shows in the past. What's our longest show we've ever done? No, I got to say, know. it's got to be over three hours. It's got to be over three <laughs> hours. Maybe not post-edit, but it's got to be over three hours. Three hours. Three. That, that's too much. Now, for the record, I have done post game shows. Well, maybe you don't know this. I don't know the longest post game show because we'll watch the games um, together. I don't know the longest post game show that I've been a part of after watching a game with you. But I, I know the Maryland post game show last year. I was on till like two a.m. because we had people calling in. We had like one hundred and fifty people calling or listening, and people calling in. So uh, no, we're going to be disciplined. We're going to keep this to an hour. And no, Alex, uh, who joined us last year. I promise Ken's comment didn't make us fire him. Uh, <laughs> that's why he's not here. Maybe he'll call in. Maybe we can get him to call in at some point uh, over the next hour. But I want to get into this because we've got game week upon us. And, Makai, it's the shortest season of all. We say it every year. It's here, and then 12 weeks later, it's gone. You get 12 games. It's the shortest season out there. 
And it's the longest out off season out there. And so we've got week zero games. We, I just got done watching a little bit ago, watching uh, Nebraska implode, which is what they do well. Um, despite, a, a, I think, a better performance from the quarterback position, they just did what Nebraska does. So um, certainly Big Ten football is upon us. Iowa starting with a non-conference showdown against the Jackrabbits of South Dakota State. But let's start with the roster and, and, and just depth at each position. And what we do here, folks, if you haven't seen this annual preseason um, show, we're calling this the unofficial preseason show. <laughs> Right, I think it's clever. No, it's the unofficial preseason show. We'll have a. By the way, for anybody who really wants to break down, I'm going to have Don Patterson, Coach Don Patterson, on later this week. Just tell everybody that'll be the, the real preseason show. But uh, let's start with the offense, Noah, because um, th- th- I think the biggest concern coming out of Kids Day, the open scrimmage here a couple of weeks ago, certainly Media Day, and just throughout fall camp, is the injuries at wide receiver. We've talked about it extensively, and for anybody who's new to the situation. Iowa losing Tyrone Tracy in the offseason. He transfers to Purdue. And, and I think everybody have to, with a level head can admit that Tracy did not play up to expectations last year. So, you know, maybe he'll perform well at Purdue. Certainly, if you're going to go someplace and resurrect your career as a pass catcher, you're going to probably go to Purdue. Uh, and then Charlie Jones waits until after spring, ends up leaving, going to Purdue. That kind of uh, throws a wrench in things. But that's the era of the transfer portal nowadays. And I don't blame Charlie Jones for wanting to showcase his skill set. But they've got injury issues with Keegan Johnson missing a lot of time since the end of last season. Nico Regani is out right now with a foot injury. Uh, Arlen Bruce is the only real guy, scholarship guy that I'm aware of that has stayed healthy throughout all of fall camp. Um, Brody Breck has been out a lot. I think he's back now. Is he back at full speed? I hope. Deontay Vines, who had a good start to fall camp, uh, at least from what Kirk Ferentz said at media day, uh, he is out for several weeks of the season. So, so they're 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 dealing with some problems. Um, Noah, without even thinking about the injuries, given what we saw from the pass offense last year and just the offense in general, 123rd, we know in total offense out of 130 FPS teams, there were no changes at quarterback. The only changes they really made at wide receiver is they added Jacob Bostic, who's a true freshman who may end up playing because of necessity. And then you lose your best specialist guy in, in Charlie Jones. You lose uh, Tyrone Tracy, and now you're de- dealing with injuries. How confident are you and I was pass catchers right now? Not very confident. I've said that before, and they have turned out to be okay. But like you said, that poor of an offensive showing last year and then losing pieces – key pieces to your offense it doesn't bode well i gotta ask you this um you guys are both vikings fans and we seem to always bring this up every year but you guys have had such a, you, you kind of i mean no offense to Kirk cousins but from an nfl uh perspective um he's kind of a polarizing figure like i know some vikings fans who are very defensive of Kirk cousins and i know like micaiah you you can't stand Kirk cousins <laughs> <laughs> so the, the thing is, is Petrus kind of was that way last year. And, and I think as the season went on and, and people just didn't see the improvement from 2020 to 2021, the patience has ran out. And we heard some of the same narrative at the beginning of last season. All he's been training all, all off season, all summer. He's going to be better. We didn't see any improvement. In fact, some of his numbers went in the wrong direction last year. And I didn't think Alex Padilla was very good when he played, frankly. Um I just don't think it's a real strong quarterback room. And I've been saying it since the end of last year that Iowa needed to go to the transfer portal at quarterback. They chose not to do that. Um, Quarterback is a position that we're always going to be talking about because not only is it the most important position on the field, Iowa asks a lot from a pre-snap routine out of their quarterbacks. Confidence in the QB position, Micaiah, and assuming that Spencer Petrus takes all the snaps or most of the snaps again in 2022. Zero. I I think Petrus has a good arm. I think it the problem is mostly from a processor kind of standpoint. Just watching him play, he always felt like he was a half step behind, unsure of what decision to make. Uh, making the safest play and not willing to push the ball downfield, especially when it was called for. And sometimes guys aren't, aren't open 
but given the game situations as a quarterback, you have to do your best to just like throw the ball to them and try and throw them open. And, and that's something you have, that, that's a high level quarterback play. I get it. He's not that level of quarterback, but sometimes you need that. And he didn't show that. So why not go to the transfer portal? I mean, I know the transfer portals. I mean, like you guys, we made this clear at the beginning of the show. You guys do not follow college football like I do, or maybe a lot of our listeners do, but you know about the transfer portal. I mean, there were more quarterbacks, capable quarterbacks in the portal this off season than ever before. And I say what you want. I, I saw people on social media uh, ripping me today, be, not really ripping me, but basically saying, Oh, how'd that work out for Nebraska? Casey Thompson is not the reason Nebraska lost that game today. And if you look at Casey Thompson's numbers, he had a terrific game and he threw for all kinds of yards at Texas last year. That was a good addition. Nebraska's got far bigger problems than Casey Thompson, Adrian Martinez, and, and the quarterback position. Their coaching staff right now is uh, in line for a major overhaul at the end of, at the, end of the season. But um, Iowa had a lot of options, whether it be Casey Thompson, Keaton Slovis, um, Calzada, Nix. I mean, you just go down the line of, of capable quarterbacks that were out there. Adrian Martinez would have been, and uh, people will argue this, Adrian Martinez would have been an upgrade. Say what you want. I think a rational person who who looks at the numbers, watches the games, I get he was erratic at times, but when you're talking about Spencer Petras, and I can tell you this right now, this is not a rip fest because I'm rooting for Spencer to play great this year, but the reality is this, and, and this is what I responded to, to someone earlier today, um, and, and I, normally I wouldn't even uh, discuss it at this point in the in the uh, the year because we're a week from from the first game. But last year in the Big Ten, and you can keep in mind, fourteen teams in the Big Ten. Spencer was eleventh in passing efficiency, ninth in passing yards, eleventh in big in, in completion percentage, and tenth in touchdown to uh, interception ratio in the Big Ten conference. Those are not good numbers. Those are well below average, and the guys who are below them are below Spencer are uh, like Noah Vedrill from Rutgers, and now Ryan Holinsky looked really good today. But that was not a very good Northwestern. That was a terrible Northwestern offense last year, and quarterback was at the top of the the list of, as far as struggles are concerned. So Noah, can you explain that the, the uh, besides just Kirk being Kirk and being old school, the refusal to go to the quarterback and entertain that option? The only thing I can think of is that it's a desire to stick with the guy that you already have in your system. Because you mentioned it, you have a very demanding position at quarterback. And especially if what you said is true, that they have a lot of pre-snap stuff and they run a very pro-style offense, you need somebody familiar with the system to run it well. Now, could they have gone out and gotten somebody with a better arm? Sure, but you have a guy that you're familiar with that's familiar with your system that's been in it for years. So maybe that's the mindset behind it. Micaiah, your thoughts on the desire or the refusal to go try to upgrade at that position? Um, In my opinion, non-expert opinion, (laughs) uh, I think it's a scheme fit thing. I think Spencer is the type of quarterback that they want, and they're not sure that they can get that same type of quarterback that would be better enough to make it worth replacing him. So so Keaton Slovis is literally a better version of Spencer Petras, and he transferred from USC to Pittsburgh, who just produced Kenny Pickett, who's going to be the starter with the Steelers likely his, his rookie year. Um, I, I think there's a good chance of it, at least by, the, by season's end. I get what you're saying. I've heard all the reason in the lines of reasoning. Uh, people say all the time. Well, I don't think that was a good reason. That's just what I think they thought. I, I've heard people say, "Why would Iowa go? To, why would why would any great quarterback want to come to Iowa?" That is the biggest defeatist attitude. I'm tired of hearing that because you're basically saying, "Oh well, oh we're, they're not going to come here, so why would we even try?" I mean, that's literally. Can you imagine living life that way, Noah? Can you imagine living life that way, like? You, you, you have an opportunity, like just talk about working a job, right? You, you're getting a job and you have two jobs in front of you. You say, well, that job is going to be, you know, that job is going to pay me double what this job is. I can either, you know, work in a drive through at McDonald's or I can, you know, do this job. I'm qualified for both. I mean, I, I certainly, as a Big Ten school, you're trying to get a, get a passer. Either guy could come there, right? You're capable of doing both, but because you feel that no, there's no way I could ever achieve that job, I'm not even going to try. 
I'm ra- I'd rather just stick with the, the drive through at McDonald's. And that's what I want quarterback. They have a drive through at McDonald's. <laughs> that's what it is. And it's not like Iowa is some small school stuck in the back half of the Big Ten. I mean, I was very you consistently a, a ranked being, team. You have a team that's on the verge of being elite with a, with a good offense. It's an elite team. In the, the top 25 the polls, they were, I think, third on the list of honorable mentions to start the season. I mean, I they mean, were in the Big Ten championship game last year. I don't care what the score was. They were in the Big Ten championship game last year. So I, I don't want to hear the people that say, no, nobody, nobody, no great quarterback wants to come to Iowa. It's the fetus attitude. And that's why if you if you if, if you're frustrated as a fan, why doesn't the fan base, why doesn't and it's not all everybody in the fan base, but why why is there a faction of the fan base? Why doesn't the coaching staff value Big Ten championships? trips to the college football playoff. That's why, because there isn't any emphasis placed on it. You can get to eight, nine wins. We're happy. 10 is a bonus, right? There's no, there is no emphasis placed on championships. And I think it's unfortunate, but quarterback position aside, the passing game is going to struggle. Um, unless they can get some health back to Keegan Johnson. And even then, I don't I don't know if Keegan Johnson's full speed and you have a healthy Keegan Johnson, a healthy uh, Arlen Bruce, and you get Nico Regani back by maybe weeks two or three, how great is that passing game? I, st- I mean, they, those guys were healthy last year, and I know the freshmen are a year older, but those guys were healthy last year. The one thing you have going in your favor in the passing game is Laporta. And yeah, I mean, Petra's shown – a reliance and a connection with Laporta last year on a regular basis. Tight end is the one position that uh, could potentially keep the offense afloat. I mean, there, I don't think there's much of a chance of this offense being worse because you really can't be much worse than 123 out of 130. That's just common sense, right? Mathematics would tell you they're likely going to go in the probabilities would tell you that they're likely going to go in the opposite direction. All right. But my question is, can they rely on Luke Lachey and, and, and Sam Laporta and maybe transfer the one transfer they did go after and get Steven Stilianos, who it sounds like he's taken some time to acclimate himself with the system here, but he's a big, big body at tight end. Um, you know, I've heard people in the media try to make comparisons. Uh, oh, you know, the uh, tandem with Laporta and Lachey is going to be, you know, reminiscent of uh, Noah Fant and, and TJ Hawkinson. I think that's a stretch for the imagination at this point. Luke Lachey was and that good was quite year. a combination of those two. So, like, getting well, back to I that. mean, I don't think you can draw up a better tandem, and I think they were underutilized, frankly. I think when you have a guy who's the athleticism of a Noah Fant, and then a guy with the just the natural skill and physicality of a T.J. Hawkinson, I think they were underutilized, uh, which shouldn't surprise us because this is an Iowa offense. But my point is, they were at least they were at least capable with Nate Stanley at quarterback with those guys. And so can you get that level of pr- production out of Laporta and Lachey? I think that's the way this offense takes the biggest jump it can take is if those guys can be even poor versions, even just poor versions of Fant and Hawkinson that year. Because if you have two really good tight ends, it does change um, how you operate. And then hopefully, you know, the wide receiver room's got to come along because I don't care what you say about Keegan Johnson and Bruce. Those guys had their moments last year, but, those guys didn't set the world on fire. Receiver separation, something that continues to need need to improve. And Nico Regani's not the fastest guy, but he talked about it media day, just his his desire to better his route running and just, just crispness and the details. Because when you're a guy who doesn't have the speed and athleticism that the guy across from you has, you, you have to be uh you know concerned with detail, right? And um, so I, I you know, we'll see. I, I'm that's the biggest position of concern moving forward. We can talk about the offensive line. There's juggling going on right there, uh, right along the, the offensive line, um, specifically at, at the two guard positions. I don't know if we're going to, you know, Jennings Dunker going to be your starting right guard. Is it going to be, um, you know, potentially Bo Stevens? Um, Connor Colby's been playing a lot at right tackle. I don't, I don't know if he'll switch back in. I would guess he'll stay out there. But Mason Richmond, according to the most the uh, most recent practices for Iowa football, Mason Richmond is back. Um, so with Richmond back, um, they've got a little bit of flexibility if he's at left tackle 
David Davidkov is listed on the preseason depth chart, but uh, he, he's not been at fall camp. He's not been at practice. Um, I heard Tom Kakert say on his show here, uh, I've not spoke to Tom about uh, David Davidkov specifically, but I did hear him say on his show he doesn't expect him to be um, a part of Iowa football this year. And uh, I, I would guess that maybe we won't see him again, um, and, which is unfortunate. I don't know if it's a personal thing or if it's a health problem. But that's a blow because he was, the, I believe, the highest rated kid in Iowa's 21 class as a four-star lineman. So that's that's a tough blow. But again, Richmond, Ellsbury, uh, Logan Jones is at center, the weight room freak. Michael Muslinski's had a good fall camp. Um, Connor Colby probably at right tackle, but maybe at, at right guard. Both Stevens, Jennings, Dunker's not on the preseason depth chart, but I expect him to be on the, the depth chart released Monday. And then Nick DeYoung, where does he fit in? He played a lot at right tackle, but you know, and I know that uh, Iowa was bad at times last year at right tackle, and, and certainly that shone through against Aiden Hutchinson, David Ojabo, and the Wolverines in the Big Ten Championship game. By the way, Aiden Hutchinson is going to be a really good pro. He's looking good so far for the Lions. Uh, have you guys seen him in, in, in so far? I haven't watched any preseason. I'm more of a – I don't really care about the preseason when it comes to the NFL. I'll, I'll wait for the regular season. Well, that guy's going to be a stud, and um, – so, line, uh, Noah, just your thoughts on the line collectively. Uh, again, you dealing with some injuries, certainly not to the extent of wide receiver, but it get, it often gets overlooked. People say, well, they lost Linderbaum. Well, they also lost Shot. They also lost Ince, and they lost Justin Britt to an injury for the season. I feel sorry for Justin Britt's guy who can't stay healthy. That's four guys that you could argue four of your top five interior linemen are gone. And the other thing I'm seeing here is at least no, – I'm not going to be able to keep up with all the changes that you just mentioned, but looking at this depth chart, most of the players are sophomore, freshman, even redshirt freshman. Just yeah. a not very experienced line. Now, I'm sure they're talented, but it'll be interesting to see how they fit it all together, especially with shuffling so many pieces around. And Jennings Dunker, the guy I just mentioned, who you're not even looking at his – at his profile, he's a redshirt freshman. He came in that 21 class as well. So, yeah, you're right. They're young. We know Logan Jones is a converted uh, defensive tackle. Um, Micaiah, your, just your thoughts on uh, a young offensive line trying to build cohesion because if you can't protect the quarterback room, you, you got really very little shot of uh, – of really – you know, it's it's dependent on several things. Obviously, you have to have the pass catchers. You have to have a quarterback that can get the, the – I mean, this is not rocket science. you got to have the quarterback that can get the – the uh, receiver, the ball, and you got to have a line that protects them. Well, it is another thing. If you have that young offensive line, it's going to manifest itself in more ways than just having passing game and protection problems. You know, Iowa is a run first team and that running game is built on an offensive line. And so if they're having interior problems, Iowa is going to have difficulties running the ball up the middle of the field. You combine that with what we're expecting potentially from the passing game this year, there you're going to see a lot of stacked boxes and it's going to be very difficult to get the running game going too. And so we can talk the running game. Tyler Goodson is looking good so far in the preseason for the Packers. Will he make the 53 man roster? I think he might. Um, he, he looks a bit, I don't know what his weight is listed at right now for, for green Bay, but he looks bigger than he was here. Um, that that's a, if he makes the roster, you're happy for the kid. I think he's a nice kid, genuine young man. Um, wish the best for him. Would help Iowa in recruiting, but it's also frustrating because I mean, yeah, the line wasn't great last year, but I thought there were times where Tyler Goodson just didn't play very well, and you know maybe it's because his weight was not where it needed to be. I will say this: Iowa does have a couple um, future studs at running back. Caleb Johnson's had a terrific fall camp. When I saw him at uh, the open practice at media at uh, Kids Day, I thought Jazzy and Patterson played really well, ran um, with the decisiveness. Running back is not a position that is especially hard to play as a freshman. Tavian Banks had him on the show the other day, and he talked about just, um, you know, running back is a position where it's, it's all about instinct, and it's not as much about learning a system. Um, obviously, there's some of that, but I think those guys, even though they didn't enroll early, have both have a chance to play. And... I was had their fair share of years where they've just been decimated at running back. So the running game has to be better. What's the magic number? Is it? I asked Tavian this, and he didn't really give me an answer. Is it four yards per carry? Is it three point eight? I think got to be close to four 
in the Iowa offense. And I think more balanced runs. You can't have you can't be mixing in two to three yard losses on first down regularly because we saw that derail entire drives for Iowa last year. You get behind the chains, Spencer Petrus, he's not a guy who's going to be able to uh, be innovative and create yardage, right? I mean, he's got to work within his system. And when you get behind the chains, you, you're kind of working out of the system. Yeah, if you're a run-first offense, by the way, I think the answer is four. Four yards per carry. No, because you have, that has to carry your your offense, the weight of your offense. I'd probably agree with that. It's a a pretty healthy number to aim for, but given the struggles, the potential struggles in the passing game, and the questions we have about the young offensive line. Are they going to get to four yards per carry? We'll see. They've got some talented running backs in the room, and the offensive line might pull together and figure some things out, and they can really get a running game going. But, again, if you can't get that passing game going, you're going to face a lot of stack boxes, you know, seven, eight guys in the box, and it's difficult to hit that three and a half, four yards per carry that you're aiming for. And, again, you get behind the chains. The other thing that does is it kind of takes away play action. And so, yeah, I mean, if you're Iowa right now, um, staying ahead of the chains is probably the most important uh, aspect. I mean, like that's that's kind of like the simplest thing that you can attribute Iowa's struggles to last year. I know that maybe I'm oversimplifying it because they can point at positions, but getting behind the chains is the primary issue because it just derails everything else. You get one negative play and all of a sudden your playbook is razor thin. And as you know, Brian Ferentz has not been uh, some um, master at play calling either. That's putting it lightly. And not only does the playbook get thinner, but it's also a momentum and mood killer. It makes it really hard to stay motivated and to stay positive about the position that you're in and continue to play well. It's really easy to get down if you're constantly getting behind on first down. Absolutely. Um, moving on to uh, fullback, we know uh, Turner Palisard is backing up. Monty Potabom, they're fine there. Uh, those are two seniors who I give credit to Palisard. Boy, that that's got to be tough. Uh, I'm assuming uh, I don't know. You know, he got here. He was a, recruited as a linebacker initially, but um, I mean, look, he stuck it out, and he's a Imagine not only having to be a, a fullback, but being a backup fullback. Like that's, I give Turner Palisar a lot of credit. I'm sure he'll play a lot in special teams. Right now, um, the place kicking duties are open. We'll, we'll see if we get some clarification Monday. Um, I think uh, Drew Stevens is the better of the two. Um, I, I think he'll start, but uh, Blom has certainly closed the gap. He's kicked well. The, the closed scrimmage, uh, what I've heard is that he was perfect as was Drew Stevens. He was perfect at the open scrimmage. Both guys were perfect at the open scrimmage. Those guys have progressed well and, and are in line to to make up for what they're losing with Caleb Shudak. Let's move and to the defense. Yes. A competition uh, also motivates both guys to play better, Yeah, to outdo the other. So now, if both guys are playing well, that's a good thing. No, I've been saying that for months, too, that uh, it sounded like Drew Stevens was overwhelmingly the better kicker. And you know, it's nice that you have one guy who's playing well, but I, I've, I've been saying it the whole time. Blom needs to start playing better to push Drew Stevens. Those guys are, you know, should be pushing each other. I, I mean, I think that's, and I think no matter what position, even we're talking kicker, there's there's a different type of pressure involved there. And I'm sure that uh, translates to practice and to uh, scrimmage settings. Uh, return specialists, we, you know, you lose Charlie Jones. That's one position's not listed on the depth chart. Will it be Riley Moss? Will it be Aaron uh, Arlen Bruce? Will it be a TJ Hall or a Xavier Wampa? Uh, Caden uh, Weijin is a guy who uh, transferred in from a JUCO school. Maybe get some time back there. It seems like I've seen Arlen Bruce in videos, clips, and and photos. The most returning punts, and that concerns me a bit because of wide receiver depth. Uh, maybe you know it's a na- it's a knack that not everybody has. You know, could Riley Moss do it? Maybe. Um, I think it'd be nice if you could have a guy like Alec Wick or Caden Weijin, who you know a couple walk-ons who maybe Weijin may not play much unless it's as a special teamer. I think he's got good speed, 
Um, somebody told me that uh, is in the know. Somebody told me a couple months ago that they thought he was maybe the fastest guy on the team. He's a really good athlete, but uh, you know, we'll see. It'd be nice if they could develop somebody to at least be average to above average because boy, you're losing an electrifying return specialist in uh, Charlie Jones defense. Uh, John Wagner at defensive end, Joe Evans at defensive end, Ethan Herkett's coming back from injury. Deontay Craig is coming back from injury. We can start with those four. You lose Van Valkenburg, but boy, you return some young talent and some old talent. I mean, it's old guys and young guys. It literally, you got Herkett and Craig who are both sophomores and you got Wagner and Evans who are seniors. Isn't that kind of the mix you want? You want your two seniors starting and you want your, you know, your young guys learning on each end. Yeah, and then you assume they're going to learn some things and they'll take over and you have confidence that they'll play well when those seniors move on next year. Now, we'll say this. Lucas Van Ness is probably going to get a lot of time at defensive end. He's listed on the interior. I think he's too good. Too, I, I mean, they're going to run him everywhere. Kelvin Bell likes to run guys inside yeah. and out. Um, We've seen that, saw that all the time last year. Constantly moving in people, you know, seven, eight, nine people. Yeah. All playing on the defensive line. It's a strength of the defense. Man, AJ Epines is a perfect example. I mean, he's certainly not your typical defensive lineman, but they were able to move him to end for, you know, at end. They were able to play him at defensive tackle. And I give Phil Parker and Kelvin Bell a lot of credit. He was effective wherever he was at. Same with Van Valkenburg. I think you're going to see the same exact thing out of Van Ness. Boy, it'd be great if you could get if if Wagner could be a dynamic pass rusher. I know at times the system doesn't create as much for uh for Wagner's side of the ball but or side of the side of the line I should say um but boy it'd be nice if both of those ends could could create some havoc like an Anthony Nelson AJ Epinesa tandem I know that's shooting for the stars but but I mean look Wagner I've always said he's he's one of the guys I'm gonna say the biggest underachieving guys here that that's not fair to John but he's got the body at 6'5 267 to be Really good. I mean, Van Ness, I think Van Ness is trimmed. Like, he's he's cut. He's physically shaped to be a dynamic player. But, I mean, you just look at the numbers. Wagoner's listed at 6'5", 267. Van Ness is 6'5", 269. So, I, I think those two guys could be great. And then you line up a guy like Herkett and Evans at times on obvious passing downs. Here's what I see at times. You're going to have a situation where you get uh, Ethan Herkett, or Deontay Craig on one end. I think you're going to have Van Ness on the interior. I think you're going to have um, Aaron Graves at times at the other defensive tackle spot, and then you're going to have Joe Evans. So in other words, you have two pass rush specialists as your ends, and then two pass rush, special, pass rush specialists on the interior, but Graves and Van Ness are both guys who are big enough to play tackle. So I think on obvious passing downs, you may see more of that. Um, but how good is Noah Shannon now? I've heard great things about him. Uh, he's been the one guy that his name ke- keeps getting brought up. Is he a guy who can be a factor in, in pass rushing situations? I certainly think he's going to be a, a a gap eater, right? He's going to be a, a a space filler, which is you know to, to be the run defense that you need to be at Iowa. You, you need those guys. Um, Louis Steck's a guy that's not listed here, number fifty. I think he's listed at like six foot two. What is he listed at? I can pull it up here. Uh, Louis Steck is listed uh, at six foot two sixty eight. He's not a real big guy, but uh, he's just a hard worker, a dog. He got some time this fall with the ones and twos. You may see him at times, and um, I feel like I'm missing somebody. We did this before we went on the show too. Who is the guy that we were missing? I can't remember. Oh, Chris, I mean, Reams. Chris Reams. May, he he may end up playing some as well. You're you're talking 10, 11 people playing oh, on this yeah. line. I think it's 11 isn't it i can't remember well you've got eight here <laughs> a lot of names you got eight here plus louis steck aaron graves i think so that's 10. 10 you're 10 and then if if chris reams you know you know he's becoming a an older guy now as a, as a junior yeah i mean and that should say something about your defensive line if you have some sort of confidence in any one of those guys getting playing time i mean if you've got 10 guys that can all play why not use them Oh, and by the way, Brian Allen, true freshman, four-star recruit, enrolled early, so he's had he's got a spring in his back pocket. So, if he's called upon, I'm I'm guessing he'll be ready. 
So uh, it's it's in it's a fascinating situation on that defensive line. I'm I'm bought in hook line and sinker. Makaya, your thoughts on just uh, depth and um, how Iowa can use that to its advantage. Um, first of all, uh, it's nice to to see that the defense is still very much intact after how dominant it was last year. I, I don't really have any concerns, especially about the defensive line. Uh, this but, yeah, and when you can rotate guys, you keep all those guys fresh. It works the other way. On the uh, the offensive line starts to get tired out on the other team. And you can keep your defensive linemen fresh and keep pushing them around all game long. Keep that extra pressure on the on the other team if you can really really accomplish that. And then if you can wear down the offensive line as the game goes on, you can start to turn the tables so that you can start to make plays defensively against the other team. I think they're going to be. I think they're going to run ten. That's my prediction. I think they're going to run ten. Um, now, injuries. It's a good problem to have. <laughs> Boy, it is, isn't it? And it doesn't like in in basketball. I've seen there have been years where Fran McCaffrey to me is is rotating too many guys. And I mean, if you're Fran and you're running eleven guys or twelve guys, I think that's too many. But I mean, here's a situation where football they're running twelve guys at, at you could say two positions, right? So I mean. Um, it doesn't seem to work. I mean, like I've never seen an example where I where I'd say, "Hey, they're running too many guys at defensive line." I don't remember a time of ever saying that. Um, so I, I foresee a situation where they're uh, they're pretty deep along the defensive line. Linebackers, I mean, maybe the strongest position on the field, and that says something given the fact that we just we're applauding the defensive line. But I mean, Jack Campbell, um, you know, he's a big guy. I mean, just, I think Corey. Start with what you told me when we were going over this before we started about these linebackers. Yeah, they're, I mean, they're all three on the Buckus Award watch list. I mean, I'm not huge into watch lists, but I mean, maybe it says it's, it's, something. Yeah, I mean, Justin Jacobs, maybe he may have the, the most pro potential out of any of them. And I think he's considered to be number three, right? I mean, they play different positions at linebacker, but. Seth, I mean, Jack Campbell's been compared to a, a, a poor man's Brian Urlacher. I don't know if he'll end up being like Urlacher. I mean, certainly in the league, that's uh, shooting for the stars. But he's got the he's got the size. I mean, you, you don't often see six foot five, two hundred fifty pound linebackers in college. Um, and then, of course, uh, Seth Benson, you know, six foot two thirty two, but really good pass rushing linebacker and just solid. I mean, he kind of reminds reminds me a bit of a Bo Bauer. Just kind of how Bo Bauer played, behind, you know, beside Josie Jewell was just a solid guy, and I, I think you're going to get. I don't know what his future in the league is, but you're going to get good production out of him as a as a senior, and certainly the potential of uh, Justin Jacobs. His athleticism at six four two thirty eight is exciting. Cooper DeGene is listed as your starting uh, cash guy. I, I don't know if that's going to stay that way. I would guess it will, but he's played every position. He's played safety. He's played corner. He was at corner last year. Um, he's an intriguing guy. He's listed at six foot. Um, let's see, where is he listed here? Six one. I listen. I've stood next to the guy Noah. He ain't six one. <laughs> he is a short, short guy. Um, he he may be six foot. I, I think that's being generous. Um, when I saw him, I'm like, who is that kid over there? And I'm like, oh my goodness, that's Cooper DeGene, who. I mean, talk about an unbelievable athlete in high school. I, I think he's got the potential to return punts, return kicks, play three different positions on defense. If they needed him on offense, he could probably play offense. I think he's that athletic, but it'll be he's an intriguing guy. Between him and Xavier Wampa in that secondary, it's going to be intriguing to see how they use those guys. Wampa, of course, not listed on the depth chart. Here's my prediction. No, I think he'll be listed this week. And if he's not, even if he's not, he's going to play a lot. Five star kid out of Southeast Polk. Um, you know, will he supplant Quinn Schulte at, at free safety by the end of the year? Maybe. Um, but Schulte, uh, you know, he's going to prove himself. Former walk on at 6'1, 208 from Cedar Rapids. They've had plenty of those examples. I mean, you think of, uh, you know, John Loudermilk and, you know, Jack Kerner last year. Um, I mean, you just, you can go down the list. Uh, Who's the kid that uh, ended up with the Rams, whose name escapes me? I can picture his face. People know who I'm talking about. But they, they've had plenty of guys at safety that, you know, start as, you know, either very um, low-recruited kids or 
walk-ons even, and they end up being really good defensive backs. I mean, think of Brett Greenwood being an example. He was not a kid who was real highly sought after, and certainly him and Tyler Sash were uh, spectacular. Uh, d- d- cornerback, we know uh, Riley Moss comes back. Jamari Harris is back. He'll miss a game due to an infraction earlier this year. Um, you get Terry Roberts, whose time is now, who's been a special team star, but now is going to have a chance to shine on defense. Brandon Diaz-Fernandez makes his first appearance on the two deeps. TJ Hall's a freshman who's been really, really impressive uh, in preseason. Just thoughts on uh, defensive back. Uh, well, I guess we can start with Micaiah. Um, any concerns at all? You know, you, you do lose a couple really, uh, three really solid defensive backs in Matt Hankins, Jack Kerner, and Dane Belton. However, you bring in a five-star in Wampa, you bring in, uh, you know, another year of development for Cooper DeGene, and then, of course, TJ Hall coming in as a as a rangy true freshman. The the secondary on, on the team might not be as good as it was last year, but um, I'm not sure that you'll actually, even if it's not as good, I don't know that anybody will actually notice because the, the core of this team and its defensive identity is his defensive line. And because of, because of that, I guess the linebackers are great too, but because the defensive line is so good, they'll be able to generate pressure. And that's going to take a lot of weight off of that defensive uh, secondary's shoulders. And it's going to make their jobs a lot easier. You're not going to have to cover as long. They're going to get more errant throws, hurried throws, those kinds of things. And it's going to make them look great and um, I don't know that it's going to be as good. The secondary is going to be as good as it was last year, but I don't think it's really – and there's no concern here for me. And you've still got talented guys back there. Absolutely. Like, Absolutely. Everybody's going to be looking at the front, what, six, seven, depending on whether or not they're playing the cash. Fifteen. But, how, <laughs> <from 15. laughs> but everybody's going to be looking at the front of the defense. The secondary is just fine. Especially with what Makai was talking about, getting pressure, getting those stops up front, putting pressure on the quarterback. It's going to make life easy for those guys. And they're talented guys. I think this defense all around is going to play really well this year. Well, well, last year, I think it was last year, Alex kept saying that he was concerned about the secondary. And I, I, I don't know, you, you probably don't remember. I don't know why I remember this from last year. But do you remember me saying you that? You still have I'm the text document from last year. You what? I think so, somewhere. Keep talking. I'll find it. <laughs> Do you remember me saying, Noah, that last year that uh, obviously for anybody who doesn't realize you're on two different screens, you are in the same room right now. You are together. Yes, yes. we're using so, one microphone too. <laughs> so, but do you remember me saying that I was not at all concerned with defensive back or excuse me, specifically corner? I do remember that. Actually. So I am not concerned, but if there was one position that I would be concerned with on the defense, certainly it would be defensive back. Am I more concerned with safety or corner? Probably safety because Kayvon Merriweather has been good, not great. And I just don't know what you're getting with Ben Schulte. You know, and, and do I think Xavier Wampa – Xavier Wampa I, – I, I would hope – and this is nothing against Quinn Schulte, but I would hope, Micaiah, that by the middle of the season, the five-star safety, Xavier Wampa, has supplanted him. You know, well, he's early. got that kind of raw talent? Yeah. I mean – you ain't gonna get him for five. You ain't gonna get him for five years. So, like Don Patterson has said, redshirting is overrated nowadays. Play him when you while you can, as long as they're ready. Uh, I, I think Xavier Wamp is gonna play a lot. Um, is he more of a, a natural free? I mean, I, I just think it's intriguing the flexibility you have with Cooper DeGene. I keep saying that because he can play so many positions. You know, if you've got somebody else that you're comfortable playing at cash, is Sebastian Castro a guy who you play at cash? Is Xavier Wampa a guy you play at cash? Is Riley Moss a guy you play at cash? If you feel good about Jamari Harris and Terry Roberts, and maybe even a TJ Hall or Brennan Diaz Fernandez, maybe you slide Riley Moss down to play cash. I don't know what they've tinkered with in practice. Um, probably less tinkering than we would think, right? <laughs> but we don't know that either. So it if there was flexibility, if there's injuries or. Yeah. You know, something's not quite working out. You can make an adjustment. If there was a position of concern, it would be defensive back, but I'm not concerned. I think this defense is going to be better than last year, and that says something. Do I think they'll create as many interceptions? I'm not going to predict that because, you know, how hard it is to get 25 picks in a season. That's what they did last year. It's ridiculous. But I also think they'll get more forced fumbles. I think they'll get more fumble recoveries because they only recovered five all of last year. 
So I think they well, have a chance. It's hard to get so many fumble recoveries when you're getting an interception so often. True. But it's an area that you can improve on and you can say, hey, we, we need to do better recovering fumbles. Is there any way you can complain about a defense as a potential to be top five in the country? Well, I will say this, and, and here's this is where I, I differ from a lot of Iowa fans. I am not bought into Riley Moss being a first team, first ballot, or first ballot, first team All American by the end of, of the season. I hope he is, but I, I think the uh, pick sixes, especially against Indiana, those, well, those pick sixes in the first game really changed how people viewed Riley Moss. He got beat on some plays. You guys remember, even against Kent State, he got beat on some double moves. And, you know, I, I talked. I asked Phil Parker that question. Is that an area where you see the biggest need for improvement for Riley Moss? And it was interesting. Phil's response was, well, I I think Riley would say that he didn't play as well as he wanted to last year. The guy won defensive back of the year in the Big Ten. (laughs) So that's actually a good sign to me, Noah, because it shows that, hey, you know, award or not, they're looking at the film. And I think they're seeing the same thing that I've seen and same thing that Don Patterson's seen. You're not staying comfortable just because you were the best in the Big Ten. You see something to improve on, and you pursue that. And if he's going to be a successful player in, in the NFL, I mean, there's a reason he came back. The NFL clearly, uh, I don't, I don't think he was ready. Uh, would he have gotten drafted? He probably would have gotten a late flyer in the fifth or sixth round. But you know, I think he could be a two to four round draft pick next year if he can make some adjustments and discipline. And I, I think he's got the speed. Um, but I do think that's going to be – it'll be interesting to see how he plays and uh, who will take over. The, you know, will Terry Roberts start week one because of Harris being out and keep the position, or will Harris take it over in week two? That, that's a fascinating situation. Maybe they'll play more nickel because they've got the depth uh, at corner. I, I shouldn't say depth. They have experience at corner. I don't think they're real deep. I mean, they're not like six or seven deep, but I think that they've got experience depth, those top three – and then a couple of guys they like uh, at five and six or at four and five. All right. Final position before we move on to schedule. Um, well, two positions, punter and snapper, right? Um, Luke Elkin, uh, the snapper, Tory Taylor uh, is going to have a chance to be whatever the, uh, what's the uh, punter award. Uh, I can't remember what it is. Ray Guy, Ray Guy Award. I think he's got a chance to uh, be at winning that this year. Probably should have won it last year. There's a lot of good punters. Um, I mean, you can't overlook Tory Taylor because he was really, really good. He was the reason why Iowa was even in a lot of those games, right? And uh, that's sad, but true. Yeah. You got a punter that good. You win the field position battle when you're losing the field position battle. <laughs> I don't like this slogan, punting is winning. Iowa fans are <laughs> with that right now. I really don't like it because I don't think it – I think it's more kind of pathetic. But it that's does – That's a defeatist attitude. Regular. That's what? A defeatist. That's a defeatist attitude. Well, Because punting means you didn't score points. Right. Can we go score points, please? Well, they if you recall <laughs> against Penn State, they did take a knee and then punt. Have you ever seen anybody ever do that? Have you ever seen anybody ever take a knee and then punt? And Not it worked. that I can remember other than that. So they'll be fine at punter. Um, they've got um, Nick Phelps, the backup punter, uh, if need be. Um, but uh, they'll be fine there. Uh, 